This video was brought to you by our brand new channel, TLDR Business. Subscribe by clicking the link in the description. Pakistan has been in the headlines for all the wrong reasons recently. Imran Khan, recently charged under the country's Terrorism Act, has been marauding across the country, accusing opposition leaders of conspiring with the CIA since his ousting in April. A current crisis has triggered widespread food and energy shortages and forced the current administration into desperate negotiations with the IMF. And now, to top it all off, the country is suffering through its worst monsoon floods in recorded history, causing thousands of deaths and tens of billions of dollars worth of damage. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at these three crises facing Pakistan, how they interact with one another, and whether Pakistan will be able to recover. So let's start out by looking at floods that have been in the headlines recently. While Pakistan has a regular monsoon season, usually beginning in early June and lasting until September, this year's rains have been unprecedented. Some provinces, like the southeastern province of Sindh, have seen rainfall equivalent to nearly six times the 30-year annual average. To give you some context, Sindh usually receives about 110 millimetres of rain in the first two months of the monsoon season, which is about the same as the UK in the same period. This season, however, it received nearly 700 millimetres, which is significantly more than what London, usually considered a pretty rainy city, receives in an entire year, which is about 615 millimetres. Even Balochistan, one of the three Pakistani provinces that usually avoids the monsoon, has received five times its annual average in rainfall. As you'd expect, these floods have done immense damage. While the capital and some more populated eastern regions have been spared, about 5 million of the 33 million people living in Pakistan have been affected, with over a thousand dead so far. One third of the country is underwater, and the government has declared 72 out of the 160 districts to be disaster zones. Early estimates suggest that some 1 million homes have been destroyed, and crops like cotton and rice, which account for most of the country's exports, have been wiped out. To make matters even worse, these floods have exacerbated Pakistan's pre-existing economic crisis, which has in turn exacerbated the country's pre-existing political crisis. For those of you who don't know, Pakistan's economy hasn't fared so well over the last few years. GDP per capita is still below its 2018 high, and a combination of excessive borrowing, a bloated military budget, and the recent global economic slowdown have pushed it into a currency crisis. The Pakistani rupee has lost about 25% of its value against the dollar in the past year, and is now trading at about half what it did in 2017. As you'd expect, inflation has kicked up and is now up to a 15-year high of 25%. Anyway, early estimates suggest that the floods have caused $10 billion worth of damage to Pakistan's infrastructure, and the impact on crops will cut off a much-needed source of foreign currency. Fabrics, which are often made with cotton, accounts for over 40% of Pakistan's exports, with rice and other food sources accounting for another 10%. The floods have already hurt Pakistan's harvest this year, and waterlogging could delay the start of the next planting season. Less exports means less foreign currency coming into the country, which could exacerbate the current currency crisis. In response to this, on Monday, the IMF approved a new $1.1 billion loan to Pakistan on the condition that the Pakistani government reduce its spending. While the IMF has acknowledged that the floods will require some more fiscal slippage in the short term, they've nonetheless insisted on some politically uncomfortable austerity including cuts to fuel and electricity subsidies, and this has exacerbated Pakistan's pre-existing political crisis. For the last few months, Pakistani politics has been rocked by a dispute between the incumbent PMLN party, led by Shehbaz Sharif, and the ousted Imran Khan. After flip-flopping on the IMF and seeing a steep drop in his approval ratings, the Pakistani parliament ousted Khan and replaced him with Sharif in April. Since then, Khan has toured the country, drawing huge crowds at his rallies and accused the opposition of conspiring with the CIA. 
Khan received a boost in July when his PTI party won 15 of the 20 seats at by-elections in the country's most populous province, Punjab, but was charged under Pakistan's Terrorism Act last month after claiming that authorities had tortured one of his aides, which the Pakistani police argue amounts to threatening state officials. Khan has since been granted extended bail, but tensions are still running very high and the recent IMF deal will only add fuel to the flames. While Pakistan clearly needed the loan, the Pakistani public aren't particularly keen on the IMF because they don't like the austerity conditions that often are attached to IMF loans. The government has already come under fire for raising electricity and fuel prices at the IMF's behest and last week backtracked on a further increase in electricity prices after people took to the streets. Anyway, Khan won the 2018 general election by promising to ditch the previous IMF programme agreed by his predecessors and instead balance Pakistan's budget by cracking down on tax avoidance. While Khan eventually ended up going to the IMF anyway, he did so unwillingly and regularly refused their lending conditions. This new IMF loan will provide Khan with even more ammunition to criticise the government and it's already proved controversial even within Sharif's party. The point we're making is that this new IMF loan, while it was probably necessary to deal with the economic damage incurred by the floods, is going to add yet another point of contention in Pakistani politics. All in all, this is pretty bad news. Pakistan now has to somehow deal not just with the worst floods in living memory, but also worsening political and economic crises. So what happens next? Well, an election is due sometime before October 2023, and it looks increasingly likely that Khan will win. As we mentioned a second ago, his party performed well at the latest by-elections, and rebuilding the country after the floods will require help from the IMF, which will in turn require Sharif to make some unpopular spending cuts. The latest poll from June gives Khan's PTI party a six-point lead over the opposition, having previously been neck and neck and it's reasonable to think that the gap has widened over the past few months. All in all, if he can stay out of jail, Imran Khan will probably be back in power within the year. And if you're interested in how the economy influences politics, you might also be interested in how businesses influence the economy. Last week, we've launched a brand new TLDR channel all about business and how it interacts with politics, people and society. We have four videos on the channel at the moment, including a deep dive into if TikTok is a Chinese propaganda tool and if Trump was right to ban them, as well as a video on the lawsuit between Musk and Twitter and the secret economics of porn, where we find out the two household names who control the whole industry. There's more to come though, so head over to the channel, check out those videos and subscribe to TLDR Business.